and my tent just flies away. It's pouring snow on me. And I remember I didn't even move. I just laid there. And I said, I just hope I wake up frozen. I'm Keela J and welcome to Keela J TV. Whether you're my OG subscriber or my newbie, we are all a family here. So sit back, share this with a friend and let's get into the episode. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I am so excited that you are here. I want you to really be disarmed in this moment. You don't have to pretend to be anyone. You don't have to pretend to be liked, pretend to be happy, pretend to be something that you're not. This is a safe place. And I want to welcome you um, to just be yourself and to receive. I'm so excited because we are interviewing someone that has a powerful testimony. You know, I'm a believer. Um, if you're not a believer, I welcome you to join the ama amazing kingdom of God. But I believe that we can be transformed and overcome our obstacles through the power of Jesus Christ's blood and through the word of other testimonies. And that's what we're going to learn about right now. I want to introduce you to Joshua Zatkoff. He has an amazing story. Joshua, welcome. Hey, how are you doing? God bless everybody. Um, amazing. Y'all welcome Joshua in the comments. I'm so excited that you are here. Where are you tuning in from right now? So uh, I am in uh, Northern Virginia, about like 20 minutes south of uh, D.C. So 20, 30 minutes That's south amazing. of D.C. That's amazing. First, I want to say, can you, can, I just want to give it up for the Lord because I just know a snippet of your testimony. <laughs> but yeah. even knowing your story, if I'm looking at you right now, I would not be able to even tell because of the transformation that god has done the work yeah. that god has done and that's like such a testimony of who we were but who we no longer have to be so can you invite us into your story how where did you start what was your moment where you had so many things that were controlling your life what were your idols in your life so you know i would say that I think the biggest one, or at least the first one, was just uh, deep depression. You know, like I remember being like eight years old and uh, I'd get so frustrated with whatever, you know, and as an eight year old, I remember, you know, getting so frustrated and I would like scratch my face until I was bleeding. And um, I, I had this like inner rage and, and frustration that I didn't really know how to deal with or what to do with it. And uh, I don't think my parents even knew what to do with it. Um, and so that kind of was the first thing that kind of crept into my life. And, you know, looking back, it's like it was just kind of there and, and no one really knew what to do with it. So it just kind of got ignored. Um, around the time I was 12 years old, I started feeling real despondent. You know, I started uh, being aware of it, not knowing that it was depression or not knowing exactly what the name was for it. I just started noticing that uh, life started to feel real dry. You know, like life started to, I started to feel separated from the world. Um, I, I lost my like excitement for life and that like innocence that a child would have. And, and um, I, I started like just contemplating, like I think the meaning of life, like my purpose, you know, like I started contemplating that stuff and getting real depressed about like feeling like life was kind of like what was the point uh, of it? And, you know, at the time I had a good life. It wasn't like I had a, a rough you know, childhood in that sense, you know, there was, you know, obviously it wasn't perfect, but, um, overall it was definitely good. Um, and, uh, so that was the first thing that really popped up in my life was just this, this anger and frustration and self-harm and, uh, and depression started popping up. And so around the same time, you know, as a child, I was really like, I was just kind of like wild, you know, like I always wanted to be doing something that my, my friends weren't doing and pushing the envelope kind of thing. And so um, I heard about weed from one of my friends that had like older cousins. And so and can I ask he had mentioned quick, that before we, before we go on to that, I would love to ask you, where do you think those feelings came from when you were experiencing that as a child? What do you think that was? Do you, did you feel any type of way? Um, where did that depression, do you know where it was really rooted from? 
So to, to be honest with you, my mom on her side of the family, she has a big sister. She's Puerto Rican. She's from Brooklyn. You know, uh, she has like eight sisters. They all were just her whole family was riddled with mental illness. One of her sisters committed suicide. Um, they were all riddled with drug addiction. Mental illness was on that that line. So I believe it was just a generational curse. Like I believe right out the womb, I was hit with that thing. Um, to looking back at it, you know, from my perspective now in life, but uh, I think it was a generational curse in that sense. Um, and can you describe but, what that is for our viewers who may not know? Well, typically, what a generational curse is is it would be you know a uh, it could it could come through witchcraft and, a, and a, a curse on your bloodline, on your lineage, and it would fall a generation to generation. Sometimes it might lay, lie dormant. It might be a curse on your bloodline or just a spirit that's just never been broken. It just runs through each each generation. Sometimes it, it might um, lay dormant in a person and wait for the right, you know, um, environment to kind of hatch in a person. I think it's it's real deep. I don't think I'm, I'm going to get into a deliverance, uh, you know, generational yeah. curse. Uh Topic, but typically that's what a generational curse is, is just something that follows your bloodline, uh, you know, through each generation. And, and it's something that uh, everyone in your family seems like they've dealt with, you know, and those are big ones. Um, but the, the next thing that I but I would say, actually, you know, even you asking that question, I, I should probably touch on it, is that, you know, I didn't even really connect this dot until recently, honestly. Um, when I was like eight or nine, uh, I went to Puerto Rico. And I got molested by my cousin. Uh, he was, you know, was a guy, and, and I, uh, I, I have family in Puerto Rico, and so my whole family stayed in one house because it's three aunts and or it was two aunts and a, uh, my great grandma. They all lived in the same like neighborhood, and so uh, I stayed with him, and, and you know, I, I had gotten molested by him one night, and he was, I think, like fourteen. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm assuming he probably got molested. You know, to be honest with you, I don't know. I've never talked to him since, you know, since that, but uh. That happened, and and at the time, I didn't even. I mean, I just knew it was like not right. Like I remember during everything that was happening, I was just like, "This is doesn't feel right. Like this mm -hmm. don't seem normal." But I, you know, he was the older cousin. I just kind of went along with it, and um, and I didn't. Uh, but I didn't ever like think about it. I just forgot all about it. And but you know, now looking back, I do believe that probably I played a part in it because as I got older, I definitely hit myself with, like you know, kind of you know man are you kind of you know what i mean even as a child yeah. like, what kind of boy are you you know you didn't stand up for yourself you just let some you know once i learned it was like way wrong so i think that might have played a role in it now looking back back then i would have never thought that um but i'm sure it affected me more than i was aware of you know um so i think it was a combination of of just those things wow 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 Woo. so how did they begin to manifest like in your older years how did they begin to grow you know because as a child you said that you were scratching you were hurting yourself you were manipulating yourself as you grew older what did that manifest it as I think in around like middle school, so like, you know, 12, 13, 11, 12, 13, 14, it, it, it started manifest. I think honestly it manifested a lot with just being real, uh, like being real reckless, you know, like doing stupid stunts to hurt myself almost and to get people's attention. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, like going swimming in an ice cold pond just cause no one else would do it. And I'll be, you know, like stuff like that. I think just yeah. getting a, attention in that, in that sense. Um, but then it, Honestly, in uh, probably it's 13, I think, when I was 13, uh, eighth grade, I had a friend um, and me and him had, I don't know what, what we both had mental illness and we didn't, you know, we didn't know this. We're undiagnosed yeah. at this point. So we don't know what this is, but we got really into like self-harming each other. And it was like fun for us. Like we would whip each other with a belt, you know, we'd work out together and get all pumped up and then like you know, just messing around, like, you know, kids just like just whipping each other with the belt and seeing wow. who could hurt each other more, you know, like punching each other. Like, you know, there's, um, uh, we would cut ourselves, stick thumbtacks in ourselves, like, you know, things that at the time, like, I'm thinking this is like just what kids do for fun, you know, and I'm, we're in our world, it was normal, you know what I mean? But, um, mm -hmm. it got to the point where like we were, we'd punch ourselves in the face and our faces would be swollen shut, black wow. eyes. And um, it got to the point where, like, 
teachers started getting concerned, like thinking we're getting beat at home. And then, you know, finding out we're doing it to ourselves just made it even more like, you know, these kids are, are nuts. Um, and so that's how it started really to manifest was I started to get like a pleasure out of harming myself. Yeah. Um, but again, I had no correlation between the two. To me, I was just, you know, that was normal. Did you have a correlation to the pain? Did you feel some type of pain or or emptiness, sadness that was causing? I mean, of course, we know that it was related spiritually to this, you know, mental illness, generational curse. But emotionally, did did it connect with you at all? No, I don't think at the time. I think at the time I, I knew I had like something was wrong with me, but I didn't know what it was. It was just there was some type of uh, like, let's say I got frustrated yeah. um, about something. I All I knew is that like if I if I cut myself, I felt better. You know, if I if if I took it out on myself, I just felt like I would feel better. And that's all I knew. And it just kind of it, it kind of fed that. And I don't know that I ever correlated a, a, an emotional, you know, response to it, to be honest with you. Wow. Whew. So how growing up, um, going into high school, middle school, so you're harming yourself. It's rooted in this mental illness. You have no idea that it's a mental illness. Were you diagnosed at all in school? Um, in any type of way? And how did this continue to manifest in other ways that were harmful? Yeah, so it, it, it got to the point, um, I'm not, I won't get into it now, I'm sure you want to get into it later a little bit. But at, uh, at this point, by the time I was 14 in high and freshman in high school, uh, I had, you know, drugs were a big part of my life already. Uh, that started at, 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 you know, 12. And but at, um, drugs were a big part of my life. And at that point, my mom, and my dad had started really noticing things like, I, you know, they started knowing what was going on and they start, it started being real. They started being aware of it. And so at that point, my um, mom and dad took me to a psychiatrist or, you know, this, it was like a very like in depth uh, to, to diagnose me type of thing. I had gone to a couple of therapists before, but it didn't really like avail anything, but I went to this this psychiatrist and it was like this all day testing. And so he diagnosed me with ADD, bipolar and uh, manic depression. Wow. So he just hit me across. You know, it's like now you have all these problems. And so what happened was, you know, they tried to give me all this medication and uh, I didn't like it at all. You know, it, it just numbed me out. I felt like a zombie. It made me it made it worse, in my opinion, because w when I wasn't on meds, to me, it was like, I had really good days and, and, you know, I have a couple of weeks where I was just real, you know, up. And then it was like, I'd be, you know, real depressed and, and suicidal at that point. I wasn't really acting on anything. Um, but it kind of, I think what really, where it, it started tipping was the first, uh, like real relationship I got into when I was, uh, when I was a sophomore, or let me actually let me, let me backtrack a little bit and sure. I went when I was um when I was a sophomore I had gone to a rehab program and it was it was a year long um, program away from my family and everything you know I was in Utah so I was 15 years old and uh the combination of I think being out there on my own put me in this like it's it's me against the world type of mentality like I mean I was I was I was in the desert it, you know it was like negative 30 with the wind chill uh i had to build my own you know shelter you know i remember i remember the very first night i was there or the first week i was there they kind of train you they teach you enough to like so you know how to make you to make a fire with the bow drill like they teach you how to survive and the first night i was on my own i mean i was with a group but you're on your own to do everything they have a counselor to make sure no one dies essentially and you know but um as this like 15 year old kid i remember being out in the middle of the, in the moab desert and like you know, all the snow, I'm freezing cold. I'm like, man, this is, you're, you're out here on your own. And I remember I made my little tent or whatever the first night and we had 50 mile per hour winds. And they're telling me like, this is the worst storm we've had in years, you know, and it's my first week there. And my tent just blew away. And so something changed. And I think my being wow. at that moment, like it was, I really turned uh, I think a lot like just cold, 
like my emotions were just done at that point. And so this, I was, you know, in this place for a couple months and I went to another rehab and at that rehab, they were, uh, they ended up getting shut down for child abuse. You know, like they were breaking kids' arms and the staff was very like aggressive and with restraining kids and just, they had- That was a mental health facility? Yeah, it was for, you know, drug addicts and, and problem kids. And so um, the combination of, I think, being in those places and, and you know, I wasn't a, like a bad kid, you know what I mean? I just was a little off my rocker, I guess. And, you know, but uh, being at that place really just turned me cold. And then I had gotten on these me these meds that I shouldn't have been on for ADD. Ooh. So so when I came back, this is now 10th grade, you know, like, I was not the same person. I had done a bunch of independent studies, so I was graduating early, um, and I was just not the same at all. I was, I was disconnected from life on a whole new level. You know, I didn't even care about friends. I didn't care about, like, I would just go to school, sit in class, I'd be the first one there. I had 4.0s in all my class, you know what I mean? Like, I would just do school and go home and, and sit in my room and be depressed all night. And so I had gotten a girlfriend, and uh, when we broke up, I just really like I think it was my first heartbreak really tested like showed me where I was at um and that was that was real rough you know like that was uh um so I think that's where that's really where it it uh took a a bad turn you yeah. know where I started noticing like this is not good like this I'm wow. concerned about myself was... oh that is so real and I think too it 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 adds a lot to what we don't really think about, about men's emotions. This is just yeah. a side topic, but just men's hearts and emotions and um, just the sensitivity, the the different type of sensitivity, sensitivity of how the Lord has made you guys. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I would love to talk about um, how you started using drugs, what that involvement was like. And did that have an effect on your psyche? Yeah. So when I when I was twelve was the first time. Maybe I, I might have been thirteen, almost thirteen. But around seventh grade, uh, I had a friend who who had introduced me to marijuana. Um, and I remember just seeing it in movies and thinking, like, you know, you know how the you know movies and stuff projected, and so yeah. it seemed really like just exciting to me. And so I had gotten some you know some weed from from this guy and uh and so i remember the first time i got high it was like every missing piece in my life clicked yeah. i mean like to me it was the missing puzzle piece of everything and so i'm like oh my gosh like this is it i found my answer and um so it, it didn't start off like doing it you know all the time I think it was like every couple months and then, but by the time an eighth grade summer rolled around the end of eighth grade i was smoking every day and so weed to me was like the, the answer for everything and so i just wanted to be high all the time and, and uh it didn't you know cause any problems in my life and i felt happy and all that and so i was just self-medicating once my family found out about it um it, it definitely became you know more of an issue because like I said, my mom has a background with addiction. My dad's side of the family has an uh, issue with alcohol. And so they're, they're like going off like, oh, no, we need to stop this, you know, before it gets mm -hmm. out of control like them. So in my mind, it's like I'm just a normal kid smoking weed. Like that's what yeah. everyone was doing, you know, in high school and stuff. And so in my mind, it wasn't really a problem. Um, but then I, what what happened is I think it probably made the, the mental illness worse looking back because – for me, it was like, all right, if I'm not smoking weed, I'm um, I'm I'm off my rocker. But if I'm if I smoke weed, I'm good. I'm oh, chill. Independency. Right, and so my but my mom's trying to like shut this down, trying to ground me. So now I'm like rebelling, or rebelling. You know what I mean? Now I'm running away. Now I'm bucking. You know what I mean? And and doing whatever. Like I didn't really care about the consequences. Like, um, but once I got 16, I got I got put on probation, and so I got a um charge and was put on probation and and what happened was i basically told my po like i'm not stopping i don't care like and so she would she i had the i had a really great po i'm actually still in contact with her to this day you know on facebook and instagram with friends wow. and whatever and um she was really cool you know and she cared about me and she 
I remember like she would do everything not to lock me up. She'd be like, Josh, like, I'm, I'm sorry. This is like your sixth dirty urine. I got to lock you up. You know, I'm, I'm sure now looking back her, you know, her higher ups were coming down on her. Like, but I'll just, I'll just go to jail. And it was like for, from 16 to 18, it was like, go to jail, come home for two months, go to jail for a month, come back. You know, it was just this, I did. And so use. for failing drug tests. Yeah. And, um, and so eventually what happened was when I was 16, I was like, all right, I can't keep smoking. Um, and so I started doing, I mean, at this point I had to experiment with a lot of different things, but weed was really all I cared about. Like I liked psychedelics and I liked weed and that was all I really wanted. And was this um, with your, was this by yourself or was this recreational? Did you no, this was just, with- yeah, it was recreational, but it was also by myself. I mean, it was, that, that, that was my whole agenda in life. You know, like my, my whole life at that point was go to school, get high before school, uh, get high after school. And that was it. Like, that was all I lived for, really. Uh, I played sports as well, but um, okay. at this time they started falling away. But um, so what happened though is when I was 16, I started doing pills uh, because of the drug test. And so at that point I, I started doing pills and within like six months I, I started shooting up heroin. It was just like, it, it was like real rapid. It was just, it was not like an increased gradual. It was like, do this and then so once I started doing that, that was when it was just, I think, all out, you know, downhill spiral. It was it was all downhill from there. Wow. Oh, wow. I would love to know, did you feel like, were you conscious? Were you conscious of your decisions? Were you just 100%, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know the implications do you feel like the drugs were helpful in medicating your emotional um, turmoil or distress? And why did you feel like you continued or even increased in your usage of drugs? Do you feel like it was a chemical dependency? Do you feel like it was more so it just helped balance you out, like you said? Or was it something that um, just became a part of your life? Well, I think it was like, you know, at, at that point, um let's 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 go to like when i was like 16 around that time frame i'll say um it started off like the only issue that drugs brought in my life were my family you know and having to try to obey their rules other than that it helped me chill out i was happier in my opinion um so i was real conscious of of what i was doing but i would say that once i i started messing with like heroin and harder drugs it was what happens is when you first do it it's magical like you know it it makes life better Mm -hmm. and so essentially like it was like i was getting you know compliments at work or you know what i mean i was doing better in life i was you know people around me would seem to enjoy me more like so that's really what where it feeds it as well as i wasn't dealing with my depression but then it's like what how, how drugs work is it's like it gives you this here and then takes more of you here you know what i mean and so it's this vicious cycle of like you come down and now you're in a deeper hole. So now you're running back to get back up and you never get back up quite as high. And, and every time you come down, you're a little bit lower. Wow. And so it, it at, very quickly, by the time I was, I would say 17, 18, 18 is really when 17, 18 at that point was, I mean, I needed it. Like I'm not, I couldn't get out of bed until I had, had it, you know what I mean? And, and if I was sober, I just would fantasize about killing myself all day. You know what I mean? Like at that point, everything was just, my life was, that was it. I was, I was a slave, you know? Wow. (laughs) Wow. Josh. How did you stop? When did you stop? What was this transformation like? I mean, you were dependent it literally almost seemed like it was your savior yeah it was a buddy to your mental health it was like helping you you know back fight off all these things that have been fighting you for so long why i mean in that case it it seems like it's such a good thing it seems like the drugs were almost like a pro um, no. But we are speaking of mental health here, and I would love to know how you began to get off this journey of this addiction. 
because it, one, it was spiritual, it was generational, it was chemical dependency, it was an emotional dependency. How did you end this cycle? So, so I think, you know, obviously it catches up to you, you know, obviously it brings a lot of things in your life. You never thought it would things you didn't ask for, um, legal trouble, financial trouble, relation. I mean, just all across the board, it's, you know, it, it, it catches up with you and, and your life starts going downhill real quick. And so it wasn't, I knew that, that my time was running out. Like I knew I couldn't do it forever. And so I think the first thing that really got me was I got a distribution charge in 2014. And so I got locked up for a year and a half. Um, when that happened, heroin. yeah, I was, I basically had middleman stuff to a girl that I was, you know, kind of messing around with and, and, she overdosed and but because i'm there i i I call the ambulance and do cpr and all that and they come but when she wakes up you know the police i'm assuming probably scared her like this stuff's here you know you're you're going and she told on me and so i got you know the charge uh for it and um and so when that hit me i had just at this point i had a a you know two-year-old daughter or you know three-year-old daughter and um uh, I was going to school for massage therapy and I had just graduated like three days prior or three days after that charge, I was graduating. I already had my certificate. So to me, it was a real big blow. Cause I'm like, man, I'm here trying to change my life. I was still in addiction, but I think the first thing I did was I started transitioning to everything to doctors. Um, so it wasn't any better, but I felt better because now I could say I have a prescription, you know what I mean? So like I was on, I was prescribed Xanax and I was prescribed Suboxone. So I wasn't really doing heroin as much, but I was on, I was still addicted to the Suboxone and the Xanax and I was still messing around with other drugs, you know, but that was when I started transitioning to trying to fight it, you know, cause at, at that point was when I was like, once I had my daughter, it was like, you know, I remember I, I was like, I'm not getting high ever again. Once I, f- I found out I was having, you know, my daughter, and I, you know, I ended up getting high in the hospital room the night she was born. You know what I mean? Like, that's how bound I was that, like, I was like, I'm not doing this ever again. An hour later, I'm in there doing it, you know? Mm. So um, that was a transition. When I got sat down for a year and a half, it really makes you think. Um, and I remember being in, in one of the facilities. Uh, by I was over by Richmond, Virginia, and uh, there was, you know, there was heroin in, in the, the pot I was in. And I remember being like, Josh, you can't keep it together in here. Like, you don't got a shot out there. And so I stayed clean that whole time. Wow. And um, I think I had Ooh. about like 14 months or something under my belt. So, I'm, you know, I'm getting my cognitive workings back together. My A lot of my like depression and bipolar stuff what didn't seem like it was really there. It was there. And I'm probably was in denial about it a little bit, but it was there, but it was, it was very, I was functional. I felt like I just had matured through a lot of it and just kind of learned like, Hey, Josh, you can't, you know, you can't cut yourself when you get mad anymore. Like it's, that's not what grown ups do. Hey, Josh, you can't, you know what I mean? Like I just started de- just probably just eating it, you know, I was probably just sitting it, stuffing it down inside, but I was functioning. And, um, and so that's really what transition was the first transition. Um, but I, that wasn't really the, the, the full transition. I think, uh, I think it was probably a couple of years down the road, you know, and I want to I wanna ask you, because you mentioned cutting yourself. Can you share a little bit about that? Um, I know that you do also have some, a history of, um, a suicide attempt. Yeah. When did this happen? And how did that affect your life? So, uh, um, you know, the cutting, I think it started off as like, just let me see how knife, sharp this knife is. And um, so it wasn't reckless behavior. Yeah, it wasn't even like, oh, I'm, I, I'm, I hate my life. It wasn't like that. It was like, I wonder, how, is this razor this sharp? And I just kind of just sliced and I saw how, how easy it sliced me. And I remember seeing the blood, like I got all warm inside. It made me feel good. Like I can't explain it. It was like some type of rush. And so I kept doing it and I was like, I don't know. It was weird. You know, I don't, that's how it started. But then the first time I really cut myself, 
like really was when I mentioned that girl I was dating um, and we went through this breakup. She, essentially she went to college and, and when she went to college, she, she just started playing with me. You know, I was still in high school back in Virginia. She's off at university and she would like, you know, FaceTime me, video time me back to whatever it was I am or whatever it was back then. And, and she would lead me on in certain ways. And then the next day be like, why are you calling me? I told you, I don't. you know what I mean? Like, and so she did this with, she just was messing with my and head. Like, with, yeah, mess with your mind. It was, uh, yeah, it was real crazy. And so I remember when, like one night she basically just told me like, you know, some mean things. And I said, I'm done. I was on house arrest at the time. And so, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm locked in my little house. I couldn't do nothing. This girl's, I'm thinking about her doing crazy things and, you know, yeah. and I said, I'm done. Like I'm leaving. So I, I was like, I'm, I'm gone. Like, I don't, and so I just, I like poked it in and I just pulled it as hard as I could. And I didn't, I didn't think I was so caught up with my emotions and I just jerked it. And what happened was I looked and my wrist was split wide open. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I went and I got my mom's sewing kit. And I like I'm I'm trying to sew my wrist back. My dad comes in, he sees blood all over his towels. He's and I mean, and and I sewed my wrist back shut. Like it, I mean, it's it scared me. But then also what happened was I wasn't afraid of it anymore. Um and and so I think that's that's I just started turning to to that, and then I think I didn't want people to see it. I was embarrassed of that. Um. So really, and then I started turning to like punch. I would punch myself in the face, and that was you know what I mean. That was kind of, you know. And I know that the the focus is mental illness, and so you know I I definitely don't mind going in into into that for you know whoever's watching. I would you know. I don't want you to go back and to. I um, your suicide attempt, because now we see you, but we did not see you then. What was going through your mind and how in the world did you bring yourself up mentally, like even from a confidence place, or did you? In 2012, I had just had my daughter. She was a year old. Um, I was, my, my, you know, my heroin addiction was at an all time low. This 2012, 2013 was probably the most reckless times in my life. Like where I just had no conscience, like I was trying to die, you know? And, um, and so 2012, I had just lost one of my, my childhood best friends in 2010, 2011. And um, so he had just died and uh, the year before and I'm going through uh, the, my daughter's mom. She's like openly cheating on me. And my self-esteem was so low that I was just letting it happen. Like I was still just letting her live with me and knowing she'd be off doing this. And I would just, I would feel lucky just to have someone come back to me. You know what I mean? And so my self-esteem was thrashed. Um, I didn't, I wasn't working. I was, I was taking care of my daughter though. I mean, I wasn't doing a great job probably, but I was there, you know what I mean? Like I, she was, I took care of her every day and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably be high, I'd take her around to sell drugs with me and, you know what I mean? It was, it was bad, but I was, I, I was raised her, you know, I was, I was there. And, um, yeah. and, um, and so I remember this one specific night, um, my child's mom was supposed to like come, she was going out with this guy and I was like, can you just hang out with me for one night? Like, you know what I mean? And, and, she basically was like, I'll come, I'll come back after. And, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna go get some wine and, and we're gonna have like a movie night. And you know, in like my mind, I wanted to have this special night. And and so I remember like she she faked on me. And so I was sitting there and I was I just started drinking all the liquor I had got for, you know, us to, to drink together. And, and um my daughter was, I think, at her dad's or something. She wasn't there. Um and uh, I remember just thinking about my life and where I lived was like, it was this, it was this real nice house, a, a civil war, like old house on the battlefield. And it was like, on, you know, it was this house. And then it had, um, to the right of it, it had this little like cliff or it was like a, ba a bank, bank hill. And then on the front of it, it had a like sharp cliff drop off and it had a little stream that went around. And, um, and so I was just sitting on the deck and I was just thinking about my life um, and I'm thinking about my friends dead, all these friends I know are dying. I'm just sitting, running my life through my head, uh, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm 19 at the time and 19, 20. And I'm like, you know, 
it, there was no emotion. Like, I, I think I was a little upset, but it was like a very cold decision where I just looked over at the, the, the balcony or the, the drop off. And I said, yeah, I think I'm done. You know what I mean? Like I said, I, like what, what, why would I want to be here anymore? Like everything's just sucked my whole life. You know, I, I, I can't get happy. I can't, you know, I can't do nothing. Right. Like I just, you know, I was just done. I just, you know what I mean? I, I I didn't want to die, but I just didn't feel like I could live, you know? And so I, I basically went inside and I, at this point, my mind had been switched off of thinking. And so I just went inside and I grabbed a microphone cord and I walked over to the cliff and I tied it around the fence. And it was probably like a 20, 25 foot drop off. And then it was like two feet of water. And I walked over the side and I said, like, I got this confidence about it where I was like, I'm not backing out now. I said, I said, all right, I'm doing it. And I just, I just stepped off. Like it was a porch or something, you know, and, and I just stepped off and then it, it, I fell and the, it, the rope caught, you know, and once it pulled, I remember being like, this was not a good idea. And it was like, Oh, this is real. And like, what are you gonna do? And, um, and next thing I know I was unconscious. I get, you know, I, I go out. And so the next thing that happened was, I felt like I was in a dream and in the dream, I felt like I was in water and I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I'm, I have no idea what I just did. Like in my mind, I, I wasn't conscious of what happened uh, in my mind. I felt like, well, this is weird. I've never had a dream where I couldn't breathe before. And I was struggling and I knew what was going on. Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden I saw like this little light just start coming towards me and it didn't get too close, but I just saw it grab my attention and it started coming closer to me and then it got me like 15 feet away from me. And all of a sudden I just felt this, the knot around my neck, just like pop open. Jeez, and I just, oh, hey. I just popped my head up and it all hit me like, Oh my gosh, did you, this really just happened. And, you know, I wasn't like drunk. I was, I was tipsy, but I wasn't like drunk, drunk, you know, like I was still very uh, aware. And so I popped my head up. It's the middle of winter. There's snow on the ground. It's December. And I'm in, you know, a little puddle of water and I'm just freezing cold. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I climbed up the side of the little ditch or whatever. And like, what freaked me out was that I go to the, the, the fence, the cord is still tied to the fence. And it was like, it was, it was maybe half the length, you know, it was like a 10 or 12 foot Mike's cord. Like, so it stretched or something, I guess the whole, the whole way, but it was still attached to my neck. And so, so I'm like, how did my head is wrecked? I go sit in the, in the, my bathtub at, in my house and my clothes. And I'm just like crying. Like, what did you do, Josh? You know? And so I basically cried myself to sleep, you know, and, wow. and the, the next morning though, I, I just stood there at the spot and just was like, what? And I mean, I had like real bad, um, purple marks all over my neck but um other than that i had no injuries and i'm looking at the drop and there's huge boulders like like even getting in the water was like five six feet over you know like i'm like how did i fall and not hit these rocks not hit my elbows nothing like and um and i remember at that point i knew that i was here for a purpose and so I, that's one thing i definitely want to tell people anyone dealing with suicidal stuff it's like it is so not worth it. Like there is, you will not gain one thing from it. It will not serve you anything. You are here for a reason. And so I knew at that point, I'm here for a reason. Something like something cared about me because something saved me. And that's all I knew. And, you know, I was so far from Jesus at that point, but I knew there was a God. And so at that point, I never thought about suicide in a serious way ever. Like, all these plans and future things flowing through my head and goals and hope and stuff that I wasn't used to. And so I, I think what happened was uh, I'm looking at like three, four years of prison time. My life is over. I just left my three-year-old daughter, you know, like in my mind, my situation's terrible. But at the same time, I'm like confused because I'm like, why am I so happy? Like, why do I have so much hope? Like, I'm like, I, li I literally feel peace. Like, and I'm looking around like, I'm in jail. This doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Like, and people are coming up to me saying like, what happened to you? And, you know, just weird stuff is happening. And all I know is that every time I would call on Jesus, I would feel God's presence. Wow. And I would be like, I'd be like laughing. I mean, people started to get mad at me because you have to understand people are going through life situations in this place. 
and they got me next to them, you know, talking about Jesus. And now, and I'm cracking up in my bed for 30 minutes and people didn't like, you know, it's like, um, people don't want to be around, you know, misery loves company kind of thing. And so I was like, God, like, I can't stop. Like I was, I was so happy and I don't know why. And then I, I connected the dots and said, Oh, wow, this is Jesus. Like, this is what this is all about. You know, <laughs> like, so would you say that's like one of the first times in your life you felt like real joy? Yeah. Oh, and it, yeah. And it freaked me out. Like I said, Oh my gosh. I said, is this, I thought I might've been going crazy. I said, like, I, I thought maybe Josh, maybe you cracked into the next level of craziness, you know? <laughs> oh, so you have, you, you were addicted to all types of drugs that fed you so much, mm-hmm. but you're saying that during this time, that was your literal first time feeling joy and peace. And yeah. Rest. Yeah, it, it, outside of like external comforts and outside of like, oh, I just got some new shoes and I feel happy. No, yeah, like that was the first time I ever felt real joy. I had felt joy on drugs before what I thought was joy, but it was always tainted. It, it always had something murky in there. You know what I mean? It always had an anxiety with it or something. It wasn't pure. And so for the first time, I'm in the worst situation in my life and I'm ecstatic. I'm being told like, hey, my mom's coming to see me. Hey, you're not getting a bond. And I remember I said, praise the Lord. I guess, you know, like, and so, yeah, it was, it was weird. It was, it was uncomfortable and I, but I couldn't help it. I, it just kept coming and, and, you know, I just kept getting filled with it. I just want you to repeat something because you said something so pivotal that you did not know Jesus. You didn't even know the Lord. There's so many people that feel like Jesus does not love them. Jesus does not care about them. Um, Especially with what they've done, with what they're doing, with what they want to do, uh, with what is even going on in the world. I just want you to even repeat that or even your knowledge today about the love of God, about how you literally have been through so much, you hurt yourself, you had no knowledge of God's love for you, but yet in that moment, it was God's love that saved your life. It was an angel of the Lord that saved your life. And from that moment, you recognize that. Can you just touch on that? You know, something God, I think, showed me that that stuck out the most after I had my encounter with, with, you know, God is, is, Jesus was, you know, it says in Romans five, you know, he, he proves his love for us is that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And so he showed me that now, like looking back at my last 15 years of my life, he was showing me where his hand was in every single thing. And I think about just the dumb amounts of times I should have been killed that I didn't. And so you talk about, you know, we're in a world where we want our love to be reciprocated. And I did this for you. You do this for me. Well, I I straight ignored him, his existence for, you know, my whole, you know, let's just even start at 12 my whole life. But let's go from 12 when I started, you know, wilding out, like completely ignored him as even a possibility, made fun of Christians, made fun of the idea of Jesus. And he was still there just showing up. And, um, you know, the love of God is, I don't think that anyone really fully understands it. I don't think that we we can. I think it. I, you know, it's the thing is, is that people like to to correlate love and God's love with life going well, and I think that's what really that's where we mess up. And I've, I mean, I've messed up there even after knowing God. We like to think, well, I'm your son. You love me. I'm your daughter. You, you know, make this right. Make, but it's so much deeper than that. It, it, it's so much deeper than that. And I think when we, we shift our perspective of God loving me in the idea of knowing, believing here he did, here he died for you. He, he did something no one else ever could do for you. It's already done. No, no, nothing in return that he needs from you. But then in the other sense of looking at it as once I came to Jesus, because I had cried out to God many times in my life. God help me here. God get me out of this. And when it happened, I didn't even say thank you. You know, I just kept moving. Uh, once I came to Jesus as I'm done, I just want you. What he showed me and what I see, I think even now, you know, I have a daughter, it's about to be one uh tomorrow. And what what I've he's Happy shown birthday. me. 
yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, he really just wants us. He just wants our heart. And mm-hmm. and so I, I realized once I started, once you believe he's real and like you, you don't think you're talking to the air. And I just started talking to Jesus about my day. Like I'd be, you know, not, not TMI, but I'd be, in, you know, in the bathroom, be like, "Am I allowed to talk to you here?" Like, you know, and I'd be having a conversation in the bathroom, like, you know, like. And so once that that started, he started answering me, and and I realized how intentional and how personal he was, and that's what kind of won me over. I think more than anything was like he really cares about the like tiniest things that no one even is aware of. Um, and once I knew him as a person, not a God in the sky, but as a, like, as, as like a husband, as, as, you know, bridegroom love, like, it, it, you know, I'm getting chills now. It, like it, it, it messes you up, you know, it, 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 it changes you. And so I think for anyone watching back to your question of like, does God love me? Like, you're here right now, you know, like think of it this way. If it was up to the devil, you'd be gone. So something's obviously standing in the gap for you right now. Something obviously has kept you here. You know what I mean? Because if there was no God and no love, why, why be here at all? You know what, what, so, um, he loves everybody, you know? The one thing that brought you pain, the lack of love that you were receiving, God literally saved your life with it, transformed your life with it. That's the love of God. I am so blessed by this story. Yeah. So blessed. I really want to have a part two, Josh. Yeah. But what I want for part two is for people's questions. I want you guys to write your questions in the comments. I want you to ask anything. As y'all can see, Josh is an open book. Nah. We, we probably, there's probably so many stories we did not get to even on this interview. But I want you to ask questions. Um, if you do not want to comment them below, you can email them in the email address below as well. And I want to address those questions in the next video in part two. They can be about any of the topics we discuss. But I think that is so powerful and transformation when you have a living witness here of the saving power mm. of God's power in your life from no matter where you came from. So I want to give glory to God for your life, Josh. I want to give glory for how he has transformed you, how he is lifting you up, how he is raising you up and helping you transform other people's lives. I just want to talk more about your story, but I know we have to go. I want to do that in part two. Um, but I just want to say thank you. And this was a blessing. Are there any last things that you want to say um, just about the power of God and what you want to say to people that are still struggling with um, depression and not realizing God's love for them or mental illness or addiction or anything? You know, one one thing I'll say real quick, I think just kind of got put on my heart is Amen. You know, uh, aimed especially towards depression. Uh, you know, actually, we had you know spoken a little bit, and I had told you about you know depression and how normalized it is now. And you know, I'm not going to sit up here and say, "Oh, ever since Jesus, I never got depressed ever again. I never got anxious ever again." I will say that probably 95 percent of my you know um, bipolar got removed. I don't take medicine. It's very very uncommon in my life. I would say that probably. 90% of my depression has been gone and about, you know, most of my anxiety, if not a hundred percent, I don't really get anxious at all. I still have little moments of a depression, but it's very, um, it, it's, it's not common and it doesn't last long. It, it wow. might be a couple of days. Um, and so, but I will say that something God has shown me about depression and specifically depression is depression really just stems and people might not want to hear this, but it's really from a selfish space. It, it, it really is from a place of, look at my life. This isn't going right for me. That's not going right for me. This happened, that happened. If you remove yourself from the equation, what, could you be, what would you be sad about? It's because you're looking at uh, how your life is going. And I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying that there's not um, even the, from you know, a doctor's standpoint of uh, chemical imbalance. 
So I'm not saying that that's a complete lie, but I believe, like I said, you know, I believe that 90% of that is, is our perspective and living in the past. And, and um, so much of my depression issues have just completely left by just letting go of the past, forgiving other people, forgiving myself and knowing like right now is a new moment, a new day, all that's gone. Everything's good right now. I got my fingers, my toes, you know, like I'm good. Um, when I do deal with depression now, I can always trace it back to me being selfish in some way, feeling like I didn't get what I deserved, um, feeling like, you know, life's not working for me. Like, like there are those kind of things where I just am like, man, it's like, you know, but it's, it's selfish at, at its root. And so I'm not un- invalidating it at all. You know, it's definitely a real thing. But um, but I would say that's one thing. Perspective. Gosh, perspective yeah. huge, huge with depression. Yeah. Wow. That's real, y'all. <laughs> No, that's real. For someone who's actually uh, struggled with depression for over five years in the past, and the Lord has healed me from it, um, thank you for your transparency. And I would say, wow, because that's that's the truth. Mm -hmm. That's honestly the truth. If we take our look off of selves and onto the, the grandeur of God, the grace of God, and also, how can we help be a blessing to others? Mm. Wow. Mm, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Josh. Of course. I want to honestly, I have so many more questions, y'all. I'm not going to lie. But like I said, put your questions down below because we can have a part two with Josh, if that's okay. I would love it. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, enjoy, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Amen. I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Um. Have an amazing day, everybody. I pray that it is filled with blessings. I pray that you allow yourself to be filled with the power of God, with the grace of God, and that you will glow in his light and not on your own strength. I pray that you will allow him to cover you. Yeah, like he is. He's a shield on your mind, on your heart, your spirit. He can surround you from anything that wants to come into you that anything that wants to come and harm you he can be your shield of protection so we thank you lord for every single person that is on this broadcast that is watching this broadcast i actually want to ask josh to come back up to pray over people if you wouldn't mind um saying a prayer yeah yeah of course father I love you. I love you with all my heart, Lord. And I just thank you for everything you do for every person watching this and every soul that's, you know, uh, taking the time to listen. Lord, I just pray that your presence would touch every single person watching. Jesus, I pray that you would have mercy on our, our misunderstanding of you, that you would have grace, that you would enlarge the eyes of our heart. Father, I ask that you would reveal yourself to anybody that, that has been wondering about you to anybody who's had questions about you. I ask, Father, that you would just begin to remove the weeds, the lies, the deception in our minds and in our hearts. Father, I ask that you would exalt yourself in our lives. I ask that you would exalt your power in our lives. I ask that you'd glorify your name in our lives. I ask for the perfect peace of Christ Jesus. You say in your word, Lord, that whoever keeps his mind on you would have perfect peace. So I just ask for the perfect peace of God to come upon every single person, any person that's dealing with depression, any person that's dealing with suicide or anxiety. I just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, let every single severing thing from your will be broken right now in Jesus' name. Let every single snare, every chain, every hindrance or oppression be lifted right now in Jesus' name. And Father, I just ask that you'd bless them, that you would draw them, and that you would keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I feel like we could be here for another five hours. <laughs> Come on, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Y'all, go follow Josh. We're going to put his information up on the screen. Y'all, Josh's page is filled with glory. Uh, the yeah. revival is here.
This episode is amazing. I cannot wait to hear what you think about it below. Put in the comments. This is how we get to know each other, y'all. So go ahead and drop what you think about this episode in the comments. Let's get the conversation going and I'll be sure to reply and respond.